good afternoon all uh, thank you very much for joining us today for this scientific session i welcome you all for this scientific session and today we're going to talk about two topics the first topic is uh, about uh, acute poisoning in children and the second topic will be handled by dr lavanya so i'm going to talk about acute poisoning in children as it's a very common uh, a cause of uh, emergency room visits in our day to day practice so overview of my topic is going to be first i'm going to talk about the incidence and burden of uh, acute poisoning in children then we're going to talk about uh, principles of uh, management and uh, further we'll be discussing how we're going to manage the children in the emergency room and uh, at the end we're going to discuss about what are the common poisons uh, which we come across in our day to day practice coming to the incidence of uh, acute poisoning in children uh, roughly about 1.2 million exposures per year has been reported in uh, america out of which about 90000 er visits are uh, reported in 2011 according to one study in uh, us and as we all know uh, poisoning is one of the common preventable deaths it's commonly seen between uh, 1 to 5 years of age as uh, children who are more than 1 year are mobile uh, but at the same time they're not aware of the dangers and the majority of them they keep everything in the mouth so that is a common reason why we see quite a lot of uh, poisonings in uh, children between 1 to 5 years in terms of types of poisoning it could be a uh, ingestion and uh, transdermal or uh, cutaneous exposure inhalation and uh, envenomation and about 85 to 90% of uh, poisonings are asymptomatic and coming to the pathophysiology which are specific to the children dermal absorption is higher than the adults as uh, they have a increased surface area compared to the weight and permeability of the skin is more as it is more uh, appropriately more than more uh, perfused and as they have a higher respiratory rate than the adults and increased uh, minute volume they more likely to have problems uh, with inhalation agents and as we all know they have a high metabolic rate and considering their uh, lack of uh, glycogen stores uh, children are more likely to develop hypoglycemia whenever they are exposed to the toxins and we all know that <clears throat> cardiac output completely depends upon the heart rate and the uh, myocardial contraction stroke volume so whereas children it is much dependent on the heart rate so any medication which decreases the heart rate will have a significant impact on the cardiac output and uh, causing them to have a hypotension faster than the adult population like whenever they have a, a poisoning with uh, calcium channel blockers and in terms of risk assessment whenever they come to uh, the hospital or the outpatient clinic it's quite important that we should assess the risk depending upon the agent what they have taken time when they have taken whether is there any evidence of mixed overdosing whether they have ingested or were they exposed to fumes or was there any topical exposure and we have to calculate what is the maximum amount of uh, toxins which they have consumed it's always very difficult to know how much uh, they have consumed as the majority of the times uh, parents will not be able to tell us exactly how much uh, they have consumed and uh, we have to calculate the dose per kg of uh, either the medicine or the substances which they have consumed and in examination uh, we should look for symptoms and signs which would uh, give us some clue about either the severity of the toxicity or type of toxicity coming to the er management 
So it's like any other emergency where you have to assess the airway first. If child is unconscious or GCS is less than eight, we have to protect their airway by intubating the child. And we have to keep a low threshold to protect the airway, especially if they have a caustic poisoning as uh, this will increase the edema after a few hours. So that's why whenever you have a, a child who has a who has consumed the caustics and if they have any minimal distress, it's always better to protect their airway before it becomes a problem. And if the saturations are low, we have to start some oxygen and if needed, uh, we have to ventilate them. And coming to the circulation assessment, if they're hypertensive, we have to give the fluid boluses. And uh, in poisoning, it's quite common that uh, children will have some cardiac arrhythmias. So it's quite important that we take the 12 lead ECG to look for any evidence of uh, arrhythmias. And in terms of disability, so child might be unconscious or agitated because agitation could be because of a new environment. And the majority of the poisons will give you the seizure activity. If they have a seizures, the first uh, drug of choice would be the benzodiazepines. Majority of the times we will be able to stop the seizures with the benzodiazepines. If the child continues to have the seizure, uh, we have to give barbiturates as a second line of uh, medication. Usually phenytoin is not indicated, especially when it comes to seizures which are related to the poisoning. And as we all know, it's quite important that we should check the sugar levels. And if the blood glucose is less than four millimoles, we should give the dextrose bolus. That would help us to come to a conclusion what kind of poison uh, child has consumed. The next comes is airway, breathing, circulation, disability. The extra thing which comes in poisoning is decontamination. So decontamination helps you to decrease the absorption of poison either from the eyes or from the skin or from the gastrointestinal tract. If eyes are exposed, it's quite important that we should irrigate the eyes with plenty of saline water so that we wash out the poison. And if we have a dilemma about skin exposure, we have to remove all the clothes and uh, wash thoroughly with plenty of water or soap with water. If they're consumed, we have to think about uh, decontamination of the gastrointestinal system. So the MECs has no role uh, in our day-to-day -day practice, especially when they come to the hospital, as the risk of aspiration is high when we force them to have the vomitings. The next consideration would be the activated charcoal. The activated charcoal usually will be considered if the child is conscious, where you don't have a risk of aspiration. The activated charcoal works in a way that it absorbs the molecules or the toxins which are water soluble. But please remember, it's not advisable when they consume the corrosives or uh, hydrocarbons or if the child consciousness is low or if the child is hemodynamically unstable. Gastric lavage can be considered if the child presents within one to two hours after ingestion and if there are no contraindications for uh, aspiration. The other thing which we can use for decontamination of the gastrointestinal system is whole bowel irrigation where you irrigate the GI system with plenty of water with uh, polyethylene glycol so that whatever the contents which were not absorbed from the gastrointestinal system will be eliminated by a forceful water irrigation of the gut. Then once the things that are absorbed into the system, the next uh, treatment modality would be considering enhanced elimination from the system. The one of the few things which we try is uh, urinary alkalization, where you alkalize the urine by adding sodium bicarbonate to the IV fluids, which can be considered if you come across with uh, salicylate toxicity. 
the few uh, poisons uh, we can consider using multiple doses of activated charcoal so that you decrease the absorption of uh, water soluble uh, toxins from the gastrointestinal system and if there is a, a poisoning with salicylates lithium theophylline the hemodialysis either continuous or the intermittent can be considered to remove the water soluble toxins then considering uh, the types of poisoning which we see in our day-to-day -day practice i thought i will discuss about uh, uh, four or five uh, common poisonings which uh, we see in our either the op or the ip practice Camphor poisoning is is uh, commonly seen in our in our day-to-day -day practice. It's commonly used in many of the topical cold medications or uh, topical musculoskeletal anesthetic preparations, and it's commonly used in uh, vaporizers, especially when we use it for cold medicines, Vicks vaporizer or bombs. And it's commonly used in religious uh, ceremonies, especially whenever we do uh, uh, pujas in Hindu families, people burn the campus. The typical presentation would be the, they would have some uh, function or the ceremony at uh, home. Within 15 to 20 minutes, somebody would realize that the child is having generally stony clonic seizures. They would not even uh, realize that child consumed the camphor. The onset of symptoms could be quite early within 15 to 20 minutes child might develop the seizures the toxic dose would be anything more than 30 mg per kilo is considered the toxic dose <clears throat> majority of the times they have a neurological complications in terms of uh, uh, seizures or uh, coma in terms of pharmacokinetics of uh, camphor usually it will be absorbed very fast from the gastrointestinal system or from the skin also the, the, you would tend to see the toxicity within 5 to 15 minutes but the toxicity results within 24 hours if we are able to <clears throat> stop the seizures and do the appropriate resuscitation and uh, manage them appropriately in the first 24 hours child will come out without any complications the camphor is metabolized by liver and excreted in uh, renal system the dose of toxicity would be somewhere between 0.5 to 1 gram and site of action is uh, cytochrome oxidase uh, in uh, neurons in terms of clinical features majority of the times you would be able to smell the camphor uh, whenever they have consumed it Acute seizures, fasciculation, confusions, delirium, and restlessness are common presentations. And they might uh, present in a respiratory failure or the depression uh, as they had uh, seizures prior to the respiratory failure. And gastric irritation can present with nausea and vomiting. And it's quite important that we should uh, take a 12 ED CG to look for any uh, cardiovascular uh, arrhythmias. In terms of acute management, completely supportive treatment, resuscitation according to standard APLS uh, protocol. And uh, we can, there is no need of uh, giving a charcoal or gastric lavage as it will be absorbed uh, immediately. There is no specific antidote. If the child presents with uh, seizure activity, we should consider giving benzodiazepines. Majority of the times, uh, they would be able to control with uh, benzodiazepines first dose. If not, we can give uh, uh, phenobarbital. The next common poisoning we tend to see in our day-to-day -day practice is uh, corrosives. So either it could be acid or alkali. The common acids are car battery fluid, which contains the sulfuric acid. And uh, descalers or uh, toilet bowel cleaners which has uh, hydrochloric acid metal cleaners which has uh, nitric acid and rust removers like hydrogen fluoride whereas in alkali group you have bleach and sodium hydroxide 
the common corrosives which we see in our uh, household uh, utilization are uh, toilet bowl cleaners and a drain cleaners and uh, paint remover uh, these are reasonably common in our day to day practice the pathophysiology is whenever they consume the corrosives it immediately causes the necrosis within seconds then followed by ulceration and perforation of the particular area within 24 to 72 hours usually the fibrosis takes about 14 to 21 days a stricture might develop within a week till four to five weeks there is some evidence to say that if they are exposed to the corrosives there are they are at risk of developing a carcinoma usually after uh, three to four decades so the the quite important thing in terms of managing uh, the corrosives is it's quite important that we need to know how much quantity they have consumed and we have to watch them carefully for any either esophageal perforation or gastric perforation leading to peritonitis in terms of management if the child is asymptomatic and uh, if there is no indication of redness or ulcers in the mouth uh, if the parents are confident that the child did not consume more quant more quantity of uh, corrosives probably we can observe them for 6 to 12 hours if they are comfortable and confident we can send them home but if they are symptomatic they have to stay either in the pacu or in the ward if they develop any evidence of strider or upper airway obstruction we have to protect their airway and in terms of decontamination as i already mentioned there's no role of emetics in our day-to-day -day practice and we should not insert the nd tube as it might damage the esophagus which has already been damaged by the corrosives there are no indication to use the systemic steroids in uh, corrosive poisoning once the child is hemodynamically stable we should consider the endoscopy to assess the severity of the damage to the esophagus and stomach and the proton pump inhibitors and h2 blockers can be started if they develop any evidence of uh, peritonitis with gastric perforation early surgery is warranted the other common thing which we see on our day-to-day -day practice is uh, all out poisoning which is a common cause of uh, op or uh, er visits the typical history would be child will be playing with the all out uh, muscular mosquito repellent child might be keeping this in the mouth and parents are not sure how much quantity they have consumed all out has uh, a pyrethroid derivative and petroleum distillate as a vaporizer the pyrethroid derivatives are not harmful to human beings they're harmful to small insects the way it works is it delays the sodium channel closure 90 percent the children are asymptomatic they might develop the sore throat stomach pain or the vomitings the systemic effects usually starts between 4 hours to 48 hours. The, if they're going to develop the symptoms because the seizures, majority of the times they develop uh, seizures, they might develop cardiac arrhythmias. There is no specific antidote as such for all out poisoning. It's completely supportive treatment. So far, we have not seen anybody either having the seizures or the cardiac arrhythmias because of uh, all out poisoning. The next common poison uh, which we see in our day to day practice is uh, uh, antihistamines. As we all know, so we have uh, cold drops and uh, cold syrups. If you prescribe the syrup, if the, if the mother has two children, probably she might give the drops the same dose like what we give it for the syrup that's a common reason of um, poisoning in uh, children 
The toxic level should be three to five times the routine dose, what we use it for our uh, routine cold prescriptions. Symptoms usually seen within 30 minutes to two hours. Half-life of uh, chlorpheniramine malleate is between uh, 12 to 15 hours. The commonly you tend to see anticholinergic effects like dilated pupils, flushed, flushings, hallucinations, ataxia, seizures, drowsiness, or uh, coma. They might have cardiac arrhythmias. So it's quite important that we take 12 ED ECG. In terms of management, as it's a medical substance, it's quite important that we should do the gastric lavage if the child presents within one to two hours after ingestion. Please consider giving activated charcoal. If they develop cardiac arrhythmias, we have to use lignocaine. If they develop seizures, diazepam is the drug of choice. If they develop hypertension, which has to be uh, treated with sodium nitroprusside. And there is a possibility that these children might develop the dystonias uh, for which we have to use uh, diazepam. The next poisoning, which I'm going to discuss uh, is uh, iron poisoning. Anything more than 40 mg per kilo of elemental iron ingestion uh, considered as a toxic dose. So even though the taste is bitter, it is very difficult to consume, but we see reasonable number of children uh, coming to the ER with acute ingestion of iron. So whenever they come, we have to calculate the elemental iron dose, how much they have consumed. If there is any suspicion about tablet ingestion of, then we should consider the X-rays. And the early symptoms would be because of the gastric irritation. Usually you tend to see the gastric irritation the first six hours in terms of nausea, vomitings, abdominal pain, and hematemesis. They might develop the tachycardia, hypertension, and shock. After four to six hours, uh, they might develop the metabolic acidosis. The pathophysiology of uh, iron poisoning is it affects the mitochondrial oxidation. In that way, it uh, causes the cell death. The common organs which are uh, involved are liver, heart, and the kidneys. If they're going to develop the uh, multi-organ dysfunction, usually they will develop within 48 hours after ingestion if we don't manage them appropriately. And uh, in terms of management, we have to send the serum ion levels immediately to know the serum ion level, blood gas analysis to pick up the metabolic acidosis, and the sugar level, LFTs and coagulation profile. Sodium bicarbonate will pretty much indicate the severity of the toxicity. And uh, if it's going to take time to get the iron levels, bicarbonate will give us some clarity or idea about the severity of the disease. Activated charcoal is not indicated as it will not absorb the iron. And uh, in terms of decontamination of the gastrointestinal system, now we can use whole bubble irrigation with the polyethylene glycol. 30 ml per kg per hour till the rectal effluent is clear, but usually it takes about six to 12 hours to reach that stage. And once we know the serum ferritin levels, we should be starting the desferoxamine as an infusion. The other common uh, poisons which we see in our day-to-day -day practice is thyroxine as uh, it's quite common that adults uh, use the thyroxine for uh, their hypothyroidism. The major thing with the thyroxine poisoning is the signs may be delayed by five to 15 days also. They might not develop the symptoms immediately. So it's quite important that we should check the thyroid function test uh, after six to 12 hours. But please remember, 
high T3, T4 will not indicate the toxicity. And children will tolerate thyroxine overdose very well. It's very, very unlikely that they will develop symptoms or the toxicity because of the thyroxine overdose. In terms of symptoms, they might develop the tachycardia, tremors, sweating, pyrexia, hypertension, and uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Could be, they might develop the convulsions and coma. The serious symptoms are very, very uncommon in uh, children. In terms of management, as I said earlier, we have to check the TSH, which will be low. T3, T4 will be high. Gastric leverage and activated charcoal, if they present within one to two hours. Propranolol for a few days. Dexamethasone and the propyl thioracil. And if they are having symptoms, we can consider activated charcoal hemoperfusion. And the other common uh, poisoning uh, which we tend to see in our day-to-day -day practice is eucalyptus oil. So eucalyptus oil is uh, used by elders, especially when they have the uh, muscle pains. And this is one of the common Ayurvedic medicines. Uh, people use it for either the arthritis or the muscle pain, but it's highly toxic. Even two to three ml of uh, pure eucalyptus oil will be toxic. If they consume more than five ml, probably they might uh, have a severe toxicity with the uh, eucalyptus. Symptoms usually develop within 30 minutes to four hours. They might present with uh, CNS symptoms, either in the seizure activity or the coma. Gastric lavage and activated charcoal are not indicated. So it's only the supportive treatment and uh, symptoms get better within 24 hours. If you just keep them safe for 24 hours, uh, they will be okay. And uh, paracetamol overdose is uh, reasonably common, but uh, we tend to see this more in the Western world rather than in uh, Indian subcontinent. Acute ingestion of more than 200 mg per kilo is considered as a, a, a significant uh, poisoning. And uh, even 100 mg per kilo of uh, consumption over the period of time or multiple times will be considered as a severe poison. If you don't treat it appropriately, they might develop hepatic failure within uh, two to three days. Serum paracetamol levels can be done within after four hours after ingestion if they present before eight hours. ALT and INR will guide us about the hepatotoxicity. And uh, NSTL system has to be started immediately if the child consumed paracetamol more than 200 mg per kilo or if we have any evidence of. Uh, liver involvement or the paracetamol levels are high. This is the nomogram which helps you, helps us to decide uh, when to start the desferaxamine. And I'm going to talk about uh, button battery ingestion even though it is not considered as a poison, uh, but it's uh, one of the, common reason why they present to uh, ER. The child will be playing with the uh, button batteries and probably younger children would have swallowed it. As their esophagus is uh, very narrow, uh, it will be stuck to their esophagus. So once it is exposed to the moisture, the electrical circuit will be completed and that slowly burns the mucosa, then the muscle and that perforates uh, the internal organs. They might present with a cough or uh, gagging episodes, dysphagia, stomach pain. If it is stuck in the upper airways, they might present with the strider. And lithium batteries are notorious to give you uh, perforation of esophagus or the stomach as it causes the liquefaction necrosis. The button batteries can uh, 
damage your esophagus and stomach uh, within two hours. So that's why it's quite important that whenever we come across uh, with accidental ingestion of a button battery, rather than uh, waiting, it's quite important that uh, we should uh, refer them immediately to uh, a facility where uh, we have a, a gastroenterologist uh, services. The complications of uh, button battery would be either the perforation of uh, esophagus giving you tracheoesophageal fistula or it might perforate the great vessels and giving the bleeding and hematemesis. Sometimes it can cause uh, vocal cord uh, damage. As I mentioned earlier, it's quite important that we should uh, refer these children to gastroenterologist for immediate removal of the button battery. Thank you. Any questions? The dose of activated charcoal is 0.5 to 1 gram. If the child is awake, it's always better that we should mix activated charcoal either with the juice or with the water. And it's quite important that we should encourage child to drink uh, activated charcoal rather than passing a NG tube and uh, causing vomitings as it will cause them to have the aspiration. And one more question was uh, about uh, urine alkalinization. You have to add uh, sodium bicarbonate about 50 ml to 500 ml of DNS. I would request Dr. Lavanya to start her presentation. 